Hello everyone, welcome to Build Your Own. First of all, I wish you all a very happy new year. May you get all the strength to sit for hours and study hard and be more successful this year. Okay, so let's continue our biochemistry section. In the previous video, we discussed about the starting of the biochemistry section. We discussed about the nomenclature of purine and pyrimidines. And in, in this video today, we will discuss about the DNA structure and its organization. Okay. So, when we talk about DNA, we say that it is a double helix structure. Now, what is a double helix? I want you to imagine a ladder. And these are the steps in it. Now, imagine that these two, these two strands are the DNA strands which are made up of sugar and phosphate. And these... Uh, steps are made up are co combination of the purine and pyrimidine bases. Okay, so I want you to imagine that this ladder is twisted. This ladder is twisted in a way and it forms a helix like this. So this is basically what is called double helix and DNA is a double helix structure. Okay, so if we discuss about the some about some important points of the DNA structure of double helix. The first point that is very important is that the two strands of DNA are anti-parallel. This means that if this strand starts from 5' dash and ends at 3', dash, then the opposite strand will start from here and end, from, end at here, 5' dash to 3'. Dash. That way, this is anti-parallel stance. Then, the second point that is very important is that A always pairs with T and G always pairs with C. A is adenine, T is thymine, G is guanine and C is cytosine. Okay, so I want you to remember that A always pairs with T with the help of two hydrogen bonds and G always pairs with C with the help of three hydrogen bonds. Okay, so here I have a question for you. If in question it is given that a DNA is to be melted and one sample has more ATs and another sample has more GCs. Which DNA do you think will melt more easily? For melting of DNA, we need to break the hydrogen bonds. So what do you think? How many hydrogen bonds will be easier to break? Of course, two hydrogen bonds will be easier to break than three hydrogen bonds because it will be much difficult to break three hydrogen bonds than the two hydrogen bonds. So the answer to the question that which DNA will melt more easily will be with the more ATs because it will have less hydrogen bonds than the DNA with more GCs. Okay, so based on this, we can conclude our third point that amount of adenine is always equal to the amount of thymine and the amount of guanine is always equal to the amount of cytosine because they always pair together. A always pairs with T and G always pairs with C. And on the basis of this, we can say that the total amount of purines is equal to the total amount of pyramidines. This is what we called Chargaff's rule. We can practice Chargaff's rule uh, by giving an example. I'll give you one example and tell you how to solve Chargaff rules equations. Okay, if there is a question that a DNA sample has 10% guanine and you have to calculate what is the percentage of thymine. So how will you do it? We say that G is equal to 10%. Okay. And from here we can say that C is also equal to 10%. And as we said that purines is equal to pyrimidines and it is a percentage form so the total will be out of 100% right okay so these together will form 20% and out of 100% the left will be 80% so the another bases left are a and t so a plus t should be equal to 80% and they should be half so 80 divided by 2 is equal to 40 so 40 will be a percentage and 40 will be t percentage 
I have a shortcut for you in this in this type of question. If in the question the percentage of one base is given, you need to just multiply it by two, then subtract the answer from hundred, and then divide the answer by two, and you'll get the percentage of whatever you take. So this is a very easy shortcut to do these type of questions. So another very important point about Sharkov's rule. is that it is only applicable on double stranded dna or double stranded rna it is not applicable on single stranded just applicable on double stranded thing okay so going further on the next topic our next topic is denaturation and renaturation of dna now what is denaturation denaturation is basically another word for melting of dna and renaturation is cooling of dna so when there is melting of dna i already told you that only hydrogen bonds break no covalent bond are broken in this process only hydrogen bonds break this is very important point now what actually happens in denaturation the double helix structure this is the double helix structure this while melting or undergoing denaturation this these two strands separate and form the single separate strand this is just the process of melting or which is called denaturation of dna and the exact opposite process of denaturation is renaturation which is cooling when we cool these separated single strands of dna the these two strands stick together with each other and form a double helix again so this is just a very simple process of denaturation and renaturation denaturation can be done by heating the dna or we can use some chemicals which are formamide or we can also use urea so after this we'll discuss about the major differences between nucleosome and chromatin many students have confusion between the between these two words but it is very simple i'll give you a very simple definition of what is nucleosome and what is chromatin chromatin is simply dna plus protein and nucleosome is dna plus histone octamer octamer you can say from octa it is eight so it has eight proteins which are h1 h2a h2b H3 and H4. All these proteins are present twice in this nucleosome structure. So there will be two of H1 proteins, two of H2 proteins, two of H H2B proteins, two of H3 and two of H4 proteins. So this together will form eight. So it will form histone octamer. This is the basic definition between nucleosome and chromatin. Okay. So let's talk more about histone. What is histone histone is basically positively charged why because it has two main positively charged amino acids which are arginine and lysine this is very important whereas dna is negatively charged as i mentioned in my previous video about the structure of the dna we discussed that it has a phosphate group a phosphate group is always negatively charged it is, so the dna will overall have a negative charge because of the phosphate group so negative and positive will combine together and it will have a very strong bond and thus it will form a nucleosome when two or more nucleosomes form a series by binding together this has the appearance of beads on string so this is also called beads on string appearance and they bind together by the help of h1 histone protein h1 is therefore also called linker protein okay so if we discuss about chromatin chromatin is basically just dna and protein and it is majorly of two types heterochromatin and euchromatin euchromatin is more open and undergoes gene expression whereas heterochromatin is more highly condensed which means that it is more 
tightly connected to each other. So when we stain these two types of chromatin, this is more open so it will have more light to go inside and it will be more easily uh, visible. So we can call it light staining because the more light will go can go inside because it is more open and more loosely bound to each other whereas heterochromatin is very highly condensed so when we stain this type of chromatin there will be less light to go inside and this is called dark staining and because it is dark staining and less light can go inside high, it is highly condensed that is it is very bound very bound to each other very tight to each other it is not open for gene expression so we can say that it is inactive and the exact opposite of heterochromatin is that it is active because it is more open and it has light staining more loosely bound so we can say that it is active the example of heterochromatin is bar bodies and for euchromatin it is apoptosis okay so this is all for today's video and as of summary for this video, at the starting of this video we discussed about the DNA structure that why it is called double helix because I told you to imagine it as a letter, twisted letter. And the three main important points that we discussed were that they were uh, the two strands of DNA are anti-parallel that is if one strand is 5 dash to 3 dash the other strand will automatically go in, the, in another direction. The second point was adenine always pairs up with thymine and guanine always pairs up with cytosine and we discussed how A and T uh, always pairs up with the help of two hydrogen bonds and G and C always pairs up with the help of three hydrogen bonds and the last point that we discussed was Chargaff's rule it was that A is all the amount of A is always equal to amount of T and amount of G is always equal to amount of C and that's why the amount of Purines is always equal to the amount of py pyrimidines. And then we discussed about denaturation and renaturation. Denaturation is the melting of DNA. And renaturation is the exact op opposite of denaturation that is cooling of DNA. And uh, then we discussed about nucleosome and chromatin. Chromatin is basically DNA and protein. And there are two types of chromatin, heterochromatin and euchromatin. We discussed that euchromatin is more open, more loosely bound and is gene active and uh, as opposed to euchromatin uh, we discussed about heterochromatin and that it is highly condensed and it is inactive and here we discussed about nucleosome which is uh, simply DNA and histone octamer and about histone octamer we discussed that there were five types of histone proteins H1, H2A, H2B, H3 and H4 all of that two times and this then forms histone octamer okay so that's all about today's video thank you for watching keep subscribing and keep motivated